have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the chat box on the webinar interface. We will be answering questions at the end of the staff presentation to ensure everyone has a chance to hear the presentation first. The best audio is generally found through the phone. Call-in number is listed at the top of the webinar box. You can call in from your phone and enter the PIN provided to listen. Please try the phone connection if you have any trouble with the computer audio. This slideshow can also be found on the SOAR website, which was linked in the webinar notice. Today's workshop will consist of a staff presentation lasting approximately 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. The workshop is scheduled to conclude at 12 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. The staff presentation has three main areas of focus, background on SOAR emissions and the need for regulations, comments and alternatives that were received and considered by staff in response to the June 2020 workshop will also be discussed, and we'll cover draft updates to the SOAR regulatory proposal. Please note that potential amendments to the regulatory text and test procedures are also posted on the SOAR website for your review. I will now turn it over to Chris to begin the staff presentation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Manisha. Hello and welcome to the webinar for the 2021 Small Off-Road Engine Pre-Rulemaking Workshop. Today, we will talk about the comments that were received in response to our previous workshop held in June 2020 and updates made to staff's proposal in response to those comments. We will provide a preview of the proposal that staff will make to the board in fall, and finally, solicit comments regarding some specific areas of the proposal. Today's workshop is the third public workshop to discuss amendments to the Small Off-Road Engine, or SOAR, regulations. We have held two workshops prior to this one, one in September 2019 and one in June 2020. During each of these workshops, we solicited feedback from the public regarding potential amendments to the regulations. Once again, we will be soliciting feedback in response to some elements of the potential regulatory proposal that we will present today. Any potential changes to the SOAR regulations that we are discussing today have not been considered by the board. Any proposed changes we will be presented to the board to decide whether to adopt after the required notice, public comment period, and any required analyses have been presented to the board. We intend to propose amended regulations to the board in fall of this year. This workshop will cover several topics related to the potential amendments to the SOAR regulations. First, I will provide some background on SOAR and its regulatory history. Then I will discuss the comments that we received in response to the June 2020 workshop. Next, I will cover the governor's recent executive order and the feasibility of zero emission equipment in today's market. Finally, I will discuss an updated potential regulatory proposal and the rulemaking process. I will begin by discussing some background about SOAR, its emissions, and its regulatory history. Small off-road engines, or SOAR, are spark ignition engines rated at or below 25 horsepower. The majority of SOAR is lawn and garden equipment, like leaf blowers and lawn mowers. However, SOAR can also be found in utility equipment, such as generators, power washers, and utility carts. New engines that are used in either farming or construction equipment or vehicles which are smaller than 175 horsepower are not subject to CARB SOAR regulations, but rather are preempt and regulated by the federal government. Examples of such equipment include chainsaws with 45cc or larger engines, air compressors, and welders. Stationary engines, such as those used in propane-fueled stationary generators installed outside a home for backup power, are also not subject to CARB SOAR regulations. Emissions from SOAR occur both while operating and not. Exhaust emissions happen when the equipment is running and are the typical engine emissions most people think of, as you can often see and smell them. Evaporative emissions, which occur both while equipment is running and while it is in storage, mainly come from carburetors, connections, and permeation through materials. Both exhaust and evaporative emissions are regulated by CARB, and updates to both regulations will be discussed today. 
small engines were among the first off-road mobile sources to be regulated when CARB adopted the small engine exhaust emission standards in 1990. These standards, referred to as Tier 1, were implemented in 1995 and 90, 1996. A second tier of exhaust emissions were implemented for some engines between 2000 and 2002. A third tier of exhaust emissions emission standards and the first evaporative emission standards were adopted by the board in 2003. And these standards were implemented between 2005 and 2013. <clears throat> Validation studies were included in the evaporative emission regulations to ensure engines were meeting the adopted emission standards. Most recently, the evaporative emission regulations were amended in 2016 to address low compliance rates observed in the validation studies and to update the certification test fuel to match fuel sold at California gas stations. This slide is probably familiar to many of you. However, this has been updated to reflect the most recent data that is available. For those of you who have not seen it, this shows a comparison between smog-forming emissions from SOAR and those from light-duty passenger cars. Smog-forming emissions consist of oxides of nitrogen, or NOx, and reactive organic gases, or ROG, with the majority of emissions from SOAR being ROG. SOAR 2020 is CARB's most up-to-date emissions model for SOAR and shows smog-forming emissions increasing from 2022 through 2040. In fact, 2021, CARB's most up-to-date emissions model for on-road mobile sources in California shows a decrease in the emissions from light-duty passenger cars through 2040. As a result of these trends, smog-forming emissions from SOAR will surpass those from light-duty passenger cars in 2021. The primary reason for amending the SOAR regulations is the need for further reduction of criteria pollutants, including NOx, particulate matter, and ozone. NOx and ROG are both major contributors to the formation of ozone and particulate matter. The 2016 State Implementation Plan Strategy details needed reductions from various sectors, including four tons per day of NOx and 36 tons per day of ROG from SOAR. There's an additional 18 tons per day of NOx and 20 of ROG reduction needed from off-road equipment from further deployment of clean technologies with specific measures not identified in the plan. The cleanest technology possible should be deployed in order to meet ambient air quality standards for ozone and particulate matter. Additionally, the increase in the SOAR inventory shown on the previous slide makes SOAR a larger contributor to overall emissions and underscores the need to reduce NOx and ROG emissions from SOAR to, ma to maximum extent feasible. Therefore, given SOAR's larger share of the statewide NOx and ROG emissions, the potential proposed amendments to the SOAR regulations seek to exceed the emission reductions in the SOAR measure and to meet the further reductions needed from off-road sources. Next, I will talk about the governor's executive order that has been issued since our previous workshop. On September, September 23rd, Governor Gavin Newsom issued an executive order that sets goals for transitioning on and off-road vehicles and equipment to 100% zero emissions in California. Additionally, the executive order addresses the need for the state of California to act more quickly and move toward a low carbon, sustainable, and resilient future. Governor Newsom specifically called out the need for the implementation of zero emissions technologies to reduce toxic air pollutants. While the executive order is large in scope, Section 2 specifically orders CARB to develop and propose strategies to achieve 100% zero emission from off-road equipment in the state by 2035. CARB strategies must be consistent with technological feasibility and cost effectiveness. In his executive order, Governor Newsom pointed out the benefits that zero emission technologies have to air quality. Zero emission technologies provide many other direct benefits to a user. Cordless zero emission equipment generally has a higher upfront cost. However, most ex users experience a lower cost of ownership over the life of the equipment due to the significant decrease in operational costs. For SOAR, a user will need, to run the, will need gas to run the equipment, and some will change oil, spark plugs, and air filters as a part of regular maintenance. Due to the relatively maintenance-free nature of Z, a typical user simply has to charge the batteries to keep the equipment running. Additionally, the equipment produces less noise pollution, subjects users to less vibration exposure, and does not expose users to harmful engine emissions.
Next, I'll be talking about the feasibility of a transition to zero emission equipment. These graphs show the population of gasoline and electric lawn and garden equipment in California. Please note that the household graph on the left is in millions of units, while the chart for equipment owned by landscapers on the right is in thousands of units. This data is from a survey conducted by the Social Science Research Center at California State University Fullerton. The group at CSUF conducted a phone survey of households, businesses, and landscapers in California to give CARB a clear picture of what equipment is in use in California. The survey was comprised of questions developed in collaboration with CARB staff, the Social Science Research Center at CSUF, industry, and other stakeholders. Based on historical trends identified in CARB's emissions inventory modeling, the residential Z market appears to be an ever-growing market. According to CARB's SOAR 2020 model, in 2016, there were approximately 15.1 million units of residential Z in California. That number has climbed to approximately 18.4 million units, million in-use units of residential Z at the end of 2020. This population increase has led to a fleet Z percentage of 71%. Additionally, there are currently at least 25 brands that produce Z in each of the major categories. Also, based on historical trends identified in CARB's emissions inventory modeling, commercial users have not transitioned from SOAR to Z to the same extent as residential users. From 2016 to 2020, the population of commercial Z has gone from approximately 342,000 units to 414,000 units. While this increase in population is significant, it only represents 0.5% of the commercial small off-road equipment fleet. There are currently at least eight brands that produce commercial grade Z in each of the major equipment types with more being developed. The previous slides have discussed equipment types that are currently ready for a transition to Z. However, we do recognize that not all equipment would easily transition completely to Z. In the June 2020 workshop, staff received comments stating that generators were an area of concern in the transition to Z. It's important to bear in mind that SOAR regulations apply to smaller portable generators. These smaller portable generators generally have a power rating that range from 800 watts to 10,000 watts and are designed to be moved with relative ease. Stationary generators, which are often installed solely for home power backup and diesel generators are subject to other regulations. Zero emission generators are on the market and can replace SOAR generators for many users' needs. The two main styles of zero emission generators that are on the market are battery banks and fuel cells. The battery banks can often be used in conjunction with solar panels to lengthen the time of service of the battery bank. Fuel cells typically either utilize a pure hydrogen source or a reformer that converts methanol or methane into hydrogen. Both of these technologies can be used as a replacement for SOAR generators. However, each technology provides its own set of challenges. The two main challenges that zero emission generators face are the higher purchase price and the ability to refuel and recharge. Staff recognizes that the purchase price for a zero emission generator can be higher. However, there are many ways that one can use a zero emission generator to help recoup the cost increase. Operating costs for zero emission generators are significantly lower than those for SOAR generators. One way to recoup the initial costs is charging the zero emission generator when power is cheapest and then using the zero emission generator as a supplemental power source for certain devices in a home when power is most expensive. Second, many consumers do not know the details of their actual power requirements and may buy a generator that is oversized for their needs. With a gas power generator, this presents a marginal cost increase, but with a zero emission generator, cost scales very closely with power, so buying the appropriate sized zero emission generator can create real cost savings. The other main challenge for zero emission generators is refueling or recharging during a power outage. Currently, there are two main technologies available for zero emission generators, battery banks and fuel cells. In the case of a battery bank, the user would need to have enough power storage to run their essential devices, such as medical equipment, refrigerators, and well pumps for the duration of a power outage. In order to reduce the size of a battery bank a user would need, solar panels could be used to charge the battery bank during extended outage. For a fuel cell, the user would need to have enough hydrogen or hydrogen source, such as methanol, to keep the fuel cell running for the duration of the power outage, just as gasoline would be needed for a SOAR generator.
In 2012, the California Public Utilities Commission gave power companies the ability to shut electric power off to protect public safety in the event of strong winds, heat events, or other related conditions. This was the introduction of the Public Safety Power Shutoff, or PSPS, concept to California residents. In 2019, PSPS events resulted in 100 total days of de-energization with an average duration of just over five days. In 2020, PSPS events resulted in 80 total days of de-energization with an average duration of just over three days. While these data are for two years, regulators and utilities project PSPS events will be less frequent and when they do happen, shorter. As these events become less frequent and shorter, the need for portable SOAR generators for home backup power will be reduced and the need for Z generators for use during, home P or during PSPS events will be reduced. As I mentioned on slide five, CARB's SOAR regulations do not apply to stationary generators and amendments to the regulations would not affect these stationary generators. Next, I will talk about the comments that we have received in response to our June 2020 workshop. On June 9th, 2020, we held a workshop where we solicited comments regarding a potential regulatory proposal. In response to our workshop, we received 1,964 comments. Approximately 96% of the comments were from environmental organizations, with the remaining comments coming from SOAR industry representatives and from California residents. First, I will discuss the comments that we received from environmental organizations. We received a total of 1,894 comments from these organizations. Sierra Club members submitted 1,880 comments. Many of these were similar and some included different requests or information. The general theme of comments received from environmental groups was to transition to Z for all equipment types in 2023 or as soon as we are able. The comments cited various reasons for the transition, such as health concerns, noise, and dust concerns. The second group of comments that I will discuss is from the SOAR industry. We received 15 comments from different industry organizations. In general, these comments were largely supportive of a direct transition from SOAR to Z without the implementation of interim standards. Additionally, some SOAR industry representatives commented that they were opposed to extending the emissions durability period for engines to the levels that were presented in the June 2020 workshop. Finally, some in the SOAR industry expressed concerns regarding generators and pumps, citing that those tools are often used in situations where electricity is not readily available. It should be noted that pumps with 40cc or larger engines are preempt and not subject to carb SOAR regulations. Similarly, stationary generators are not subject to carb SOAR regulations. The final group of comments that I will discuss is those that we received from California residents. We received 55 comments from California residents. Residents expressed a need for engine power generators for home power backup. Additionally, residents expressed the desire for greater incentive program availability to assist in the transition from SOAR to Z. Finally, some residents wanted to ensure that any battery waste associated with a large scale transition to battery powered equipment would be properly recycled. In this section, I'll be discussing specific comments and alternatives that we received in response to our June 2020 workshop and how staff has updated the proposal as a result of the comments staff received and staff's evaluation of the alternative proposals. After the June 2020 workshop, staff received comments that the transition to Z should be made as soon as possible. This alternative was evaluated by staff and it was determined to be not feasible for all equipment types. Additionally, staff received comments that there should be no interim emission standards between the current standards and the setting of the standards to zero. In response to these comments, staff's plan to propose that all standards for SOAR, except for generators, be set uh, to zero for model year 2024. This is the earliest date of implementation that staff can propose, and this eliminates the interim emission standards for non-generator SOAR that were proposed in the June 2020 workshop. Staff also received comments stating that generators were not currently ready to transition to Z. This alternative was also evaluated by staff. Staff recognized that additional time for generators to transition to Z would be helpful for market development. In response to this alternative, staff updated the proposal to set emission standards for generators to zero four model years later than for other SOAR. Finally, 
staff received comments stating that the emissions durability periods that were proposed in the June 2020 workshop were not feasible. Data from the CSUF survey and engine user manuals suggest that engines are operated beyond the current emissions durability periods. Nevertheless, staff recognize that ensuring engines meet the emission standards beyond the current emissions durability periods could require significant costs. The updated emissions durability periods are the longest of the currently available durability periods for each engine class. The new durability periods represent extended operation and there is equipment that are certified to these periods. The updates that were made to the potential staff proposal are a result of the evaluation of the alternatives that were proposed to staff. Based on the analysis to date, the proposal is the most cost-effective and least burdensome of the suggestive, suggested alternative provisions. Now, I will provide a preview of the emission standards that staff will be proposing for, to the board. First, exhaust and evaporative standards will be set to zero for model year 2024 for all SOAR except generator engines. Manufacturers could produce model year 2024 20, and later uh, engines by using emission reduction credits to offset engine emissions. In order to help ease this transition to Z, the updated staff proposal includes provisions for trading evaporative emission reduction credits. For model year 2024 through model year 2027, more stringent emission standards will be implemented for generators. Finally, generator engines would be required to meet exhaust and evaporative emission standards of zero for model year 2028 and later. Finally, to aid with the transition of generators to Z, staff is proposing a zero emission generator emission reduction credit program, which also includes tra credit trading provisions. In the previous slide, I discussed the model year 2024 through 2027 emission standards for generator engines. This table shows the exhaust emission standards that staff will be proposing. For generator engines with displacement less than 225 cc, the emission standard would be 6 grams per kilowatt hour. For generator engines with displacement between 225 and 825 cc, the emission standard would be 3 grams per kilowatt hour. Finally, for generator engines with displacement greater than 825 cc, the emission standard would be 0.8 grams per kilowatt hour. The standards that we will be proposing to the board are based on current certification level of existing engines. Along with new exhaust emission standards, we will be proposing new evaporative emission standards for model year 2024 through 2027 generator engines. For generators with engines with displacement less than or equal to 80 cc, the new standard will be 0.5 grams of hot soak plus diurnal emissions per test. For generators with engines with displacement between 80 and 225 cc, the new standard would be 0.6 grams of hot soak plus diurnal emissions per test. Finally, for generators with engines with displacement greater than or equal to 225 cc, the new standard would be 0.7 grams of hot soak plus diurnal emissions per test. The emission standards would apply only to model year 2024 through 2027 generator engines, and these standards are based on certification levels of existing equipment. As a result of SAS proposal, in 2035, CARB staff initial estimate is that 94% of equipment subject to CARB SOAR regulations would be Z in California. While the governor's EO states a goal for emissions from off-road equipment to be zero in 2035, the SOAR equipment lifespans vary greatly depending on the equipment type, with some equipment lasting over 20 years. Additional strategies may be needed to transition the remaining equipment subject to CARB's regulations and preempt equipment regulated by the federal government to Z by 2035. As a result of staff's proposal, in 2031, which is the year that California is required to meet the 75 PPB ozone standards set forth by the US EPA, ROG and NOx emissions would be 62 tons per day lower than without new emission standards. In 2037, which is the deadline for extreme non-attainment areas in the state of California to meet the 70 PPB ozone standards set forth by the US EPA, ROG and NOx emissions would be 88 tons per day lower than without new emission standards. <clears throat> While the previous slides show areas of the proposal that staff are intending to present to the board, 
The following areas are still under development and we are still looking for input from stakeholders. The specific areas of the proposal about which staff are especially interested in comments and alternatives are the zero emission generator credit provisions, the, re the repeal of the variant section, elimination of design certification, and updates to the test procedures. As previously stated in this presentation, staff will be proposing zero emission generator credit provisions to facilitate the transition from solar powered generators to zero emission generators. This program is intended to accomplish three goals. The first is to provide a market signal to encourage growth in this sector. Growth in this sector has been relatively slow. However, with recent technological advancements, zero emission generators are providing more power and becoming less expensive to purchase. This program must also remain technology neutral to encourage innovation. Finally, this program should incentivize the early transition from SOAR generators to zero emission generators, encouraging both consumers and manufacturers to embrace zero emission generators. Staff has developed a four level system for zero emission generators. The levels of zero emission generators are based on both the continuous power delivery capability and the surge delivery capability. These criteria were selected to remain technology neutral and any proposal made for this program should take that into account. The zero emission generator credit provisions would allow manufacturers to generate exhaust and evaporative emission reduction credits for averaging banking and trading. Additionally, zero emission generator credits could only be used to offset emissions from generator engines. Here, you see the criteria for each level of zero emission generator and the exhaust credits that a manufacturer would generate. Note that the power supply requirements are expressed in terms of the energy that a generator must supply in eight hours. This delineation was made to ensure that both a device that generates power and a device that stores energy would be eligible to apply for this program. The credit eligibility amounts would offset emissions from a SOAR generator that would have been used in place of the zero emission generator. This table shows the evaporative credit eligibility for each level of zero emission generator. It should be noted that level one and two zero emission generators earn the same amount of evaporative credits. Level three and four generators also earn the same amount of evaporative credits. As with the exhaust credits, the credit eligibility amounts would offset emissions from a SOAR generator that would have been used in place of the zero emission generator. Staff is also considering the repeal of the variance section that currently exists in the evaporative emission regulations to coincide with the effective date of any approved amendments. This date might be January 1, 2023. Currently, the regulations allow a manufacturer to apply for a variance if it cannot meet certain evaporative emission requirements due to extraordinary reasons beyond its reasonable control. Since the new emission standards will be set to zero, staff do not expect that a manufacturer would not be able to meet the standards for extraordinary reasons beyond its reasonable control. The repeal of this section would ensure equity for all manufacturers and prevent the introduction of non-compliant engines into commerce. Another element of staff's proposal is the addition of credit trading provisions for evapor evaporative emission credits. We expect this would alleviate the need for any variances. In the September 2019 and June 2020 workshops, staff proposed the idea of eliminating design certification. In the June 2020 workshop, staff requested data showing what design standards would result in equipment that would meet new emission standards. Staff did not receive any data demonstrating the efficacy of any design standards. So once again, staff is requesting the submission of data supporting design certification for generator engines. To ensure that the data that is provided is usable, we request emission data for evaporative emission control system components and complete engines tested using CARB test procedures. If we receive data demonstrating that design standards can be used to create compliant equipment, then CARB may propose keeping the design certification option for generators for model years 2024 through 2027. The final area of the proposal that staff is requesting stakeholder feedback on is updates to test procedure 902. In the September 2019 and June 2020 workshops, staff discussed the addition of a tilt test for equipment in TP 902. 
originally, it was proposed that equipment be tilted to 90 degrees in four directions. Staff received comments that stated that a tilt towards the carburetor is known to cause fuel spillage. Staff will propose a tilt test that no longer includes a tilt towards the carburetor. In addition, the tilt test could be omitted for engines with displacement greater than or equal to 225 cc used only in equipment that is designed not to be tilted. We welcome feedback on these updates. As a quick recap, staff's proposal will transition new sales to Z by implementing emission standards of zero for all SOAR except generators for model year 2024, with generator emission standards being set to zero for model year 2028. Other elements of staff's proposal include the zero emission generator credit program, the repeal of the variant section, elimination of design certification, and updates to the test procedures. These topics are marked by asterisks, and we are specifically requesting feedback for staff's consideration on those topics marked by asterisks as we finalize our proposal for the board. Finally, I'll discuss the rulemaking process, including next steps. CARB staff are committed to making the rulemaking process open and transparent. We ask stakeholders to engage with us and express their thoughts on the potential rulemaking. All of you participating today are already engaged in the process by joining our workshop. If you have any comments, ideas, or data to share after the workshop, our contact or information will be provided. I showed a timeline similar to this on slide two, but I wanna remind everyone of the timing for our process. We would like to receive any comments on the regulation amendments discussed today and available in full on our website by April 8th. We welcome comments on any aspect of what we presented today, especially the topics where specific feedback was requested. Your comments will allow us to develop our final regulatory proposal to propose to the board this fall. The remaining steps the CARB staff has to accomplish are listed here. After this workshop, staff will consider the feedback that was received in response to the proposal and develop the final staff proposal. The Standardized Regulatory Impact Assessment, or SARIA, will be released. After that, staff will re release for comment the Initial Statement of Reasons, or ISOR. A 45-day comment period will occur after the ISOR is released, and finally, the board will hear staff's proposal in fall of this year. Please submit comments to SOAR2021 at arb.ca.gov. The presentation slide deck is also available on the SOAR website if you wish to review any of these slides. Contact information for staff is on this slide. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please submit them using the chat function in the webinar. Thank you, Chris. So I will get started um, taking Q&A in the, um, the questions um, option you have to submit. Um, and I will start off with the first question from Greg Mitchell. So Greg asked, small off-road engines, solar, have been our focus up until this point to reduce California's emissions inventory. Now that elimination of these SOAR is being considered as the next step, the focus needs to be redirected to the actual devices that these engines are found on and the amount of power, kilowatt hours, these devices require. Many types of construction equipment, fire and life safety devices, agricultural machines, et cetera, require more power, 10 to 25 and greater horsepower, over long periods of time, 24 hours plus, to be effective. Since batteries and battery chargers, like the fuel cells presented in this workshop, cannot effectively power these devices, what is CARB considering to allow these devices to be operated in California? Thanks, Matt. This is Dorothy Fadiger with ARB. Um, this is a great question. Um, and in fact, most of these devices that you refer to are what are called preempt devices. So uh, preempt devices are non-road engines or vehicles um, under 175 horsepower, which are used in construction equipment or vehicles or used in farm equipment or vehicles. Um, these devices are not subject to CARB regulations. They're covered by US EPA regulations, and so they wouldn't be subject to these new SOAR regulations. In addition, um, 
fire and police departments and other entities that specialize in emergency response may purchase emergency equipment powered by a non-California certified engine uh, when such equipment with a California certified engine is not available. Um, and that's done uh, through approval um, by the executive officer. Thanks, Dorothy. The next question is from Patrick Waters. Patrick asks, thanks for allowing the opportunity to comment regarding slide 27, the proposed changes to the regulatory proposal for generators are not currently ready to transition to Z, is set emission standards for generators to zero for model year 2028, and implement a zero emission generator credit program. How does CARB know that zero emission portable generators with capabilities similar to today's solar models will be commercially available in the specified timeframe? This could deprive the people of California of potentially life-saving products. Thanks, Patrick. Um, we know that they will be available because they already are available. There are zero emission portable generators available today that will back up um, a refrigerator and a laptop um, and cell phones for uh, over two days. Um, they're listed at 55 hours right now is the largest one I've seen. Um, so they exist now. What we view as not being quite ready at the moment is really the market more than anything else. Um, so what we're giving is time for the market to really make that transition um, and for there to be more zero emission generators available um, and have that availability be more widespread. All right, so the next couple of comments were about audio, thank you for letting us know that it was working. So the next comment is from Andrew Miller. He asks, in addition to public safety power shutoffs, it is difficult to determine the frequency of power shutoffs due to the other reasons such as fire or adverse weather conditions. There are 7,172 current outages within the state of California. How has CARB taken this into account? Yeah, there are absolutely um, a variety of reasons for power outages. Um, the public safety power shutdowns uh, came up a lot after our last workshop, and that's sort of why our focus was on them. Um, but really, all power shutdowns are pretty similar, um, and we don't really view there as being a fundamental difference in how to account for those shutdowns over um, a public safety power shutdown. Um, the public safety power shutdowns are frequently long in length, um, a lot of these smaller power outages that happen get repaired much faster um, because they're smaller in scope. It's really the large scale power outages that take some time to repair. Um, and so they're accounted for the same way as the public safety power shutdowns. Our next comment is from Sri Kanchi Botsla. And it said, thank you very much for organizing this workshop regarding slide 15. Does other LNG include portable generators? Do you have data that supports that portable generators are a large contributor to emission pollution based on the frequency of use? Yeah, thanks for that question. Matt, can you jump us back to slide 15? Um, so, no. Portable generators are not included in this um, graphic. This graphic is only about lawn and garden equipment. Uh, portable generators are part of what we term light commercial equipment, which includes other equipment like power washers, um, some compressors, some other equipment. Um, and then for the second part of the question, um, do we have data that supports portable generators are a large contributor to the emissions? Um, yes, in fact, portable generators are the largest contributor to SOAR emissions um, currently, and they currently are uh, almost 20% of SOAR emissions. Um, and that is both because they have a pretty big population, there are a lot of those generators out there, and they have pretty high frequency of use. So both those things contribute to generators being the largest single SOAR pollutant source. All right, the next question is from Brandon Schmidt. 
I appreciate the time that CARB staff has taken to review questions and provide feedback during today's workshop. Can staff please explain the meaning of power supply requirements of exhaust emission credits for Z generators? For example, for a level one zero emission generator, does the generator need to provide 2.5 kilowatt hours over a time frame of eight hours without recharging? I'm sorry, I've scrolled down. Or replacing the batteries or other power source. Yeah, I can go ahead and take this question. Um, first of all, thank you, Brandon, for the question. Um, currently, the the way that the levels are set up is supposed to be um, a total power delivered over um, a total time. Um, and again, like I mentioned in the slides, this was kind of selected um, in order to remain technology neutral. Um, a battery, like if, if you were to go a battery bank route, um, then it would have a finite amount of power unless you had recharge or battery replacement um, available. Um, but like this example, two and a half kilowatt hours over a time frame of eight hours would be a little bit um, more than 300 watts per hour. Um, so I think the idea here is just some sort of a total uh, power dispersed over uh, a total time. And again, this is just to remain technology neutral. All right, the next question from David Johnston. Has CARB reached out to the logging industry and forest management agencies to discuss economic and wildfire risk increase impacts? resulting from banning gas-powered chainsaws. Yeah, so this goes back to the first question we had, um, which addresses preempt equipment. Um, so uh, chainsaws larger than 40, 45 cc's and larger are included in preempt equipment and are therefore not subject to CARB regulations. They're regulated by the US EPA. Um, so those chainsaws would be unaffected by this regulation. Um, in addition, groups like CAL FIRE who do forest management work and others who do um, critical forest management work can um, apply for an exemption to buy a non-California approved engine for use in public safety. Next comment is from the question from Mina Atta. Mina asked, thank you for holding this important workshop session, slides 29 and 30. Can you provide data that are proposed that the proposed emission standards are feasible for portable generators without putting additional cost burdens on consumers? The slides indicate that they are based on certification levels of existing engines. Is it based on certification levels of existing engines used on portable generators? And I will go to the slide. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, the cleaner portable generators are more expensive. Um, how much more expensive varies a little. Um, they are, the, and the standards are based on engines used both in portable generators, so there are portable generators that meet these standards already, and there are also additional engines that meet the standards that are used in other equipment. Next question is from Todd Bollinger. Please include that emissions credits, including EVAP, can be used to sell ice beyond 2024 model year. Yes, that is the design of these regulations is that any um, emissions credits that have been banked uh, prior to 2024 may be used to sell, um, to manufacture uh, internal combustion engines beyond the 2024 date when the standards are set to zero. Okay, and we have David Johnston. In regards to the proposed generator emission standards, what exactly does based on certification levels of existing equipment mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what it means is that there are engines certified for sale in California today that meet or exceed the standards that we are proposing. Um, so we know they are technologically feasible because there are engines that already meet or exceed these standards. Um, so they already exist for sale in California. And then another question from David Johnston, stating zero emission generators are more expensive is very vague. What is the magnitude of more? 10% higher, 1000% higher, et cetera. 
Yeah, so that varies a lot depending on the user's need. Um, if you are a person who tailgates and wants to run your stereo, um, you can spend less on a zero emission generator than you do on a solar generator. Um, the largest uh, portable, uh, nope, that wasn't true. Uh, there are portable batteries that vary a lot um, in price today. Um, so they can be, I would say up to 10 times more expensive than solar generators, but it varies a lot on your needs. It also depends on what solar generator you're comparing to. Um, so it can vary from cost savings to um, about 10 times the price. Um, and this is why it's really important for consumers to be informed and know what their power requirements really are um, and figure out what they really need and to buy the minimum backup generator that will fit their needs. Next question is from Greg Mitchell. It is an oversimplification to describe portable fuel cells as zero emission generators. They are basically battery chargers. How does CARB see fuel cells being able to store generators? Yeah, I can go ahead and address this. Um, <clears throat> Portable fuel cells uh, are a zero emission technology that can produce power. Um, and again, CARB is, is really just trying to stay technology neutral in, in how this problem uh, is being solved. Um, so we're not being prescriptive in that a fuel cell has to be used uh, without a battery attached. Um, again, this is, this is all, um, it, it, it's kind of up to industry to determine how the problem is solved. Um, so a, a fuel cell could certainly be used in conjunction with a battery um, and then use that system as a uh, all-in-one kind of zero emission generator. Next, we have a question from Sarah Samurai. Can credits generated prior to 2024 model year be used to offset engines produced in 2024 model year and later? If so, is there a date that this will no longer be accepted? Can Z credits be used for engines and generators 2024 model year and later? If so, is the date that this will no longer be accepted? Can credits generated prior to 2024 model year be used to offset engines produced in 2024 model year and later? If so, is there a date that this will no longer be accepted? Can Z credits be used for engines and generators 2024 model year and later? If so, is there a date that this will no longer be accepted? Yeah, these are great questions about the uh, credits. And the answer is yes, the credits may be used um, in 2024 model year and later. The only date after which the credits will not be accepted is once they have expired. So all credits in the SOAR regulations currently um, have a five year expiration date. So after five years, those credits expire. And so after that point, they would not be um, accepted, but any time prior to that, those credits would be accepted, whether they are generated um, from cleaner gas engines or if they are Z credits. Um, the only difference uh, in the Z generator program that we have proposed here is that those Z generator credits can only be used uh, to offset emissions from generator engines. All other credits that have previously been earned or would be earned um, through model year 2023 could be used to offset emissions from any equipment type. The next question is from Dennis Lamberty. To address slide 19, since CARB is recognizing the challenges associated with zero emission portable generators, why is CARB moving forward with mandating them in the proposed regulations? Yeah, we view the major problem with zero emission generators today and the reason that transition can't happen as quickly um, is a combination, is really primarily a market driven issue um, and that the market for Z generators has not been that robust and there are not that many options on the market. Um, though there are some good ones on the market. Um, and we think with the push in this direction in the Z generator credit program that that will help move the market in the direction of Z generators. Um, we don't view this as a fundamental technology issue uh, because there are 
portable Z generators out there that can cover most people's needs. Hey, we had another question from Sarah Samurai. Sarah, I think um, that question was a repeat. If it wasn't, please submit it again. But the next question is from Callie Medin. Could you please repeat what you mentioned regarding the use of credits for SOAR equipment, except generators after 2024? Yeah, so there are current SOAR um, credit programs in place where manufacturers can earn credits um, for making engines that are cleaner than two days standards. They can earn emission credits offsets for that. Um, they can also earn credits by making zero emission equipment that meets certain standards um, that uh, is essentially uh, commercial grade zero emission equipment. Um, and those credits have an expiration date of five years. So any credits that are earned that are still good 2024 and beyond may be used to make gas powered engines. Um, they need to be sufficient to offset versus a, um, a standard of zero. So they need to offset whatever emissions occur above the standard of zero. Next, we have a question from Joy Walters. Topic trading for credits exchange. How is this different from programs that are currently available, such as SCA QMD, commercial exchange 75%? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, thanks for asking this because I think this is the thing that probably um, uh, there's a little bit of confusion about. There are a couple of different programs. These credit trading programs that we're talking about right now apply to manufacturers. Um, so manufacturers who make cleaner engines can then make some engines that exceed today's standards um, by using the credits. Um, and that would happen um, into the future also for the uh, when the standard is set to zero in 2024. Um, programs like the South Coast Exchange Program um, are done by the district and are not um, directly regulating the manufacturer. Those are credit, uh, those exchange programs are directed at um, end users who can purchase equipment for less money by exchanging um, their equipment. Okay, next we have a question from Laurel Moorhead. If I certify my source system this year, 2021, using TP902 and I meet the new proposed requirements, as well as the current requirements, for example, I include the proposed hot soak and fuel cap test, well, I still need to retest when the new TP902 becomes implemented, even though I already met the new requirements. Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. If I certify my source system this year, 2021, using TP902, and I meet the new proposed requirements as well as the current requirements, for example, I include the proposed hot soak and fuel cap test, will I still need to retest when the new TP902 becomes implemented, even though I already met the new requirements? Hi, this is Christopher Dilbeck with CARB. Um, to answer this question, uh, testing this year would be done according to the current procedure. Uh, and there is not a provision for um, testing according to a procedure which has not yet been adopted. So testing this year could be done according to the current procedure, testing according to any future amended procedure could only be done once that procedure uh, were adopted and um, had become effective. Next, I see that Denise Bulbul has two questions. Uh, we'll get to those in the order they came in. Denise, there's a couple that came in between. So first we have Eric Williamson. Eric asked, with 0.5% adoption rate of Z among landscapers who are predominantly small business with revenue less than $100,000, has CARB considered how a transition to more expensive Z will impact the landscaping industry? Uh, 
yes, we have absolutely considered this and are still considering this. Um, it's important to remember that while the upfront price of Z is more expensive, um, operators, particularly those who use their equipment a lot, such as landscapers, um, professional users, actually earn back that upfront cost pretty quickly on most equipment. Um, and that's because they have savings in terms of not in terms of cheaper fuel costs for electric equipment and also lower maintenance costs for that equipment. Um, a complete version of our economic analysis, um, including the impact on the landscaping industry, will be available uh, in our standardized regulatory impact assessment, um, which will be published uh, in the late spring or summer on the Department of Finance website. Next, we have John McKnight. Some marine watercraft have stationary generators for operation underway. Are these regulated under SOAR? Um, John, we would need more um, specific information about what types of generators you're talking about here. Um, the answer would vary depending on the details of the generator. Okay, Denise Bobo, we have your first question. Will previous public comments received be considered in the current public comment opportunity, or do we need or do we have to resubmit our comments to be considered? All comments that have been previously received um, will still be under consideration. Um, if you would like to resubmit comments um, or repeat things or say anything different as a result of this uh, workshop, we would welcome those comments, um, but we are not dismissing comments that we have previously received. Okay, we have B. Mitter Miller. Will there be incentives for small business owners to transition to Z gardening equipment? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, most incentives um, in California are done at the district level. Um, so it's good to check in with your district and see uh, what's actually available. Um, there are, some of them are funded by the state. Some of them are funded locally by various provisions. Um, so it can vary a lot by district about what's actually available, but they're administered by the district. We have a website that is ard.ca.gov slash ZEE. -E. Um, for zero emission equipment. Um, and there's a link on there that will take you to the active incentive programs that we're aware of at the moment. You can also check your Air District's website to see what programs are available. Um, so there are a handful of districts that have current um, commercial grade equipment exchanges um, that are available for small businesses. Uh, I know for sure that South Coast, Santa Barbara, and um, and San Joaquin are running them right now. Um, other uh, air districts have had them in the past and may have them again in the future. Um, and if you're looking for a district in particular to have them, um, it can be good to reach out to the district and let them know that there's interest. The next question is from Greg Knott. Thank you for the opportunity to provide questions. Staff said 2024 was the earliest date of implementation can propose. Please elaborate on how this date was determined. Hi, this is Christopher Delbeck. We're um, unmuting uh, Matt Kristen. Just hang on a minute.
Yeah, hi, this is Matt Christian with CARB. Uh, yeah, the, the Clean Air Act requires a two-year lead time for new standards uh, adopted by California. Um, so that's generally the, uh, the reason why we uh, selected 2024 as the earliest date. It's two years from the potential effective date of the upcoming rakes. Uh, next, we have Denise Bobol. Could you explain why you separated out Sierra Club comments, given that they were likely individual comments submitted by Californians? Yeah, we only did that for simplicity of summarizing the comments. Um, a lot of the comments were um, substantially similar um, and had a lot of the same content in them. Um, and so we grouped them together um, to be able to provide some statistics rather than um, reading out each individual comment. But it's not that they were considered in any lesser way or any differently than other individual comments. Next, we have a question from Uma Shawala. In some cases, equipment manufacturers own evaporative certification. What does model year 2024 mean for engine manufacturer and equipment manufacturers who own evaporative certification? Also, is there a transition period for equipment manufacturers use the engine slash components that were built before 2024? Hi, it's Christopher Dilbeck. Um, I think if I'm understanding correctly, the, the question has to do with um, the use of engines of a given model year um, uh, in evaporative families. Uh, and um, the, the regulations do uh, provide for engines from model years that don't necessarily match the model year of uh, the evaporative family to be used. Um, in, in the case of the uh, draft proposal that was presented today um, for model year 2024, uh, certified components would neither be required um, nor would um, their use um, affect certification. So all engines would be required to meet the hot soap plus diurnal emission standards um, and, and the use of, for example, a model year 2023 engine uh, versus a model year 2024 would not have an effect on that. Uh, Kristen, we're gonna go back to you for a response. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I meant uh, the date of adoption on Greg Knott's question. It's uh, two years from the date of adoption, which uh, put us at January 1, 2024. Consider we're going to be, uh, the board will be considering this in the fall. So just wanted to make that clarification. Okay, the next question is from Dan Carter. Can you provide the analysis used that would support the proposed Z initiative? as a suitable alternate to portable generators. Yeah, we looked at um, what generators are used for generally um, and what the power requirements of those use are um, and what Z generators can actually fill those uses. Um, and so people are using them for home backup sometimes um, in emergency cases. Um, and in that case, they're really looking to back up things like a refrigerator um, and, you know, charge their laptop and phones um, and run simple things like that. Um, and so the Z generators are a suitable replacement for that. They also get used um, in camping sometimes um, and in other um, outdoor places where power is not available, um, and there are Z generators that will fulfill those needs. Next, we have Eric Smith. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Leaf person was, was one question before. Leaf asked, is there any concern about CO2 emissions? Yeah. 
Yes, there are definitely CO2 emissions um, from SOAR. They are not the primary focus of this regulation, um, but they are definitely there. Um, and we view the CO2 uh, reductions that we would get from this um, as a bonus. Um, so currently, let me see, I have the number in front of me of current CO2 emissions from SOAR. Yeah, current SOAR CO2 emissions are uh, about 3,700 tons per day of CO2. Um, and so that would decrease uh, as all equipment subject to carb soar regulations is transitioned to zero emissions um, and the remaining emissions uh, of CO2 would be from preempt equipment. Next is a question from Eric Smith. He asks, what length of time could the Z generator support a 5,500 kilowatt hours of power? Speaking from the RV market and the reliance of generators with high output in these markets. Yeah, I don't have that number off the top of my head um, or in front of me anywhere. Um, I don't know how long they would support um, 5,500 kilowatt hours of power. Um, there are higher power needs um, and there are bigger Z generators available. They are more expensive. Um, and also in the RV market, um, more and more campsites have plug-in places for RVs um, and don't require um, backup generators. Um, so I, I would need to look up how long they could run 5,500 kilowatts. Okay, next we have a question from Patricia Kushner. And Patricia, I also see you had some issues with the audio. I hope those were resolved. If not, could you let us know again in the chat? Uh, but her question was, I have concerns about justice, equity, and diversity, and inclusion issues if we ban gas-powered blowers. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly um, what the concerns are um, that you have. Um, if you could um, maybe elaborate on your concerns um, and ask a question about it, um, I'm not sure exactly how to address this. Um, or what you're referring to as your concerns. Next, we have David Johnston uh, comment, PSPS are not the same as other outages. PSPS usually occur when the sun is shining. Storm-caused power outages occur frequently in the Sierra Nevadas and coastal ranges in the winter. ZEG cannot be recharged with solar during storm events. Um, yeah, that's a really good point um, that storms uh, do make solar recharge more difficult, um, but those storm power outages um, also uh, are not frequently as long as power, public safety power shutdowns. Um, and there are backups available that will uh, run basic needs for over two days. Um, so uh, there are, with that, and that's without recharge, without any solar or recharge. Um, and those are available already. And then a lot of the houses in the Sierras have um, installed stationary generators, and those are not subject to SOAR regulations. Next, we have Joy Walters, a uh, topic, trading for credit exchange. Question relates to yard equipment for landscapers, gardeners. I'm not sure, Joy, if that if that was a follow-up question to something else. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what's being asked here, but I'm I'm gonna guess this is about um credit training for landscapers and gardeners. Um and this is good. We can go back to this uh point. Um the credit trading that we've been talking about is for um soar engines only. Um so you can generate credits uh by making cleaner soar engines. Um, or by making zero emission equipment. And these credits are used by manufacturers to make other SOAR equipment. Um, there are exchange programs um, for landscapers and gardeners in some air districts. Um, those are separate from the credit trading programs that we have in the SOAR program. All right, next we have David Peach. 
The emissions benefits assume the elimination of internal combustion solar. In many situations, especially remote locations and or work sites, electric power is not readily available. This would necessitate remote recharging of source Z. Using an IC source generator would defeat the purpose and benefits of the Z. Would the use of an IC generator uh, to recharge a source Z be considered a defeat device and therefore illegal? Matt, could you read that question one more time? The emissions benefits assume the elimination of internal combustion sore. In many situations, especially remote locations and or work sites, electric power is not readily available. This would necessitate remote recharging of sore Z. Using an IC sore generator would defeat the purpose and benefits of the Z. Would the use of an IC generator to recharge a sore Z, I lost my place. Defeat the purpose and benefits of the Z with the use of an IC generator to recharge a source Z be considered a defeat device and therefore illegal. So the um, the idea of charging uh, a zero emission generator with a, a solar powered generator is not um, an ideal situation. Um, the regulations are um, for production uh, manufacture of new engines. Uh, these do not place requirements on users. So um, from an emissions perspective, charging a battery uh, with a gasoline power generator is not ideal and it's also not covered by the regulations. All right, next we have Zeal Tashpuria. Thank you for the updated information. Could you please clarify the ABT? What durability period is required for ABT? 1,000 hours or 5,000 hours? Is ABT based on the current standards? It can be used up to model year 2027. Is this correct? Uh, the durability period uh, for ABT and for certification depends on the engine size um, and varies by engine class. Um, so there's not a single answer to that. Um, Matt, can you repeat the question? I think I only answered part of it. Sure. Thank you for the updated information. Could you please clarify the ABT? What durability period is required for ABT? 1,000 hours or 5,000 hours? Is ABT based on the current standards? It can be used up to model year 2027. Is this correct? So ABT today is based on the current standards. When the standards of zero go into effect, then the ABT program would base on this, be based on the zero standards that are in effect um, at that time. Okay, next we have Ty Riggins. Thank you for the workshop. Is there a life requirement of Z similar to emission durability life of SOAR? Uh, so uh, most Z is not regulated by CARB. There are op optional um, certification. There's an optional certification of zero emission equipment um, available for zero emission equipment um, if generate if manufacturers wish to generate um, credits for it and there is a lifetime requirement on those equipment um, but other Z that is not certified by CARB does not have a lifetime requirement implemented by CARB. Okay next we have Hidiharu Takamoto. It is very important to accurately estimate social benefit to determine cost effectiveness of the rule with science based approach. The SOAR 2020 was updated well over off road 2007, though. There are multiple issues such as outliers and so on, therefore, validation and update are still needed. Could CARB share the schedule of updating the model? Uh, 
Uh, the SOAR 2020 model that's available um, on CARB's website, along with documentation about it, is final based on the current data and test data available. Um, there will be new SOAR models in the future as new data is available. Uh, SOAR 2020 establishes the baseline emissions for SOAR and will be used to um, estimate the emissions benefits from the rule for SOAR. All right, next we have a question from Greg Knott. Is it correct to understand from the revised ROs and the presentation that credits for SOAR except generators cannot be generated after 2024? With a zero limit, Z will no longer be able to generate it credits. Additionally, industry previously commented during a workshop that there is no CO banking program, but the 2024 CO limit is zero. This would make the idea that banking may be used for 2024 and beyond impossible. Um, I'll take the first part of that question from Greg. Um, it is correct that uh, credits could not be generated after 2024, um, aside from the generators. Um, once the standards are set to zero, credits are based on um, emissions that are lower than the standards that are set. And once the standards are set to zero, nothing including Z will exceed those, will be lower than those standards. Uh, in terms of the CO, um, we 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 do understand the comment, and um, if if you have suggestions uh, for CO, um, we would welcome those. All right. Next, we have Boots Kruger. Thank you for this informative workshop. Looking for clarification if engines with 225 cc or greater attached to a pump. For example, sewer cleaning equipment by means of high pressure would be exempt. Yeah, pumps are part of, uh, larger pumps are part of preempt equipment. So a pump um, with a 225 cc or greater engine um, would not be subject to these sort of regulations and would be regulated by the US EPA. Okay, next it looks like Michael Carroll has a two-part question. I'll read both of them. Um, staff has not provided any evidence that zero emission portable generators are adequate for extended emergency backup power. Current zero emission portable generators have limited peak power and lack 240 volt AC outputs, making them unsuitable for operating critical household equipment such as refrigerators and air conditioners. Current zero emission portable generators can only be operated for a relatively short period of time, 50 minutes, before recharging batteries which cannot be done during power outage. Um, I'm not sure um, where you're getting information that zero emission generators that are available now cannot be used um, for critical um, household equipment. Um, they certainly can be used for refrigerators now. Air conditioners are a big, um, power drain and will drain a zero emission generator much faster. Um, and it's true, they will not run as long. There are zero emission um, portable generators on the market that will run a refrigerator for several days. Um, those exist. Um, air conditioners are harder to run, but are also less critical household equipment. Uh, next, we have a comment from Michael Carroll of Latham and Watkins LLP. Um, they have submitted comments on behalf of the Portable Generator Manufacturers Association, PGMA. PGMA was formed in 2009 as a trade association of portable generator manufacturers in the United States. Its members include the major industry manufacturers of portable generators sold in North America and a significant majority of the industry. One of the most important applications for portable generators is to supply emergency backup power that would be needed during a power outage of an electric utility, which may last for hours or days. Generator usage is not in the same category as the other products, since it is relied upon in emergency situations when there's no other option for power. 
Staff has not provided any evidence that zero emission portable generators are adequate for extended emergency backup power. Current zero emission portable generators have limited peak power and lack 240 volt AC outputs, making them unsuitable for operating critical household equipment, such as refrigerators and air conditioners. Current zero emission portable generators can only be used for a relatively short period of time, 50 minutes, before recharging batteries, which cannot be done during power outage. These limitations cannot be overcome with current or reasonably foreseeable battery technology by using more or larger batteries. As explained in PGMA's written comments, sufficient replacement batteries for even a 24-hour period would cost in excess of $40,000. A single battery large enough to meet the same demand for just 24 hours would weigh in excess of 800 pounds. It is unclear how these options could be transported under current DOT regulations. These options would result in significant battery disposal issues. The presentation adds a new potential fuel cell generator alternative without addressing the important practical considerations such as lack of widespread availability, the development time for manufacturers, and cost to average consumers. Banning the sale of spark ignited internal combustion engine powered portable generators would put residents of California at risk during emergency situations. The inability to operate household appliances and metal equipment during a sustained power outage could have life or death consequences. If households were not able to remain safe on their own, this would place additional burdens on emergency responders during a crisis situation. The adverse impacts would fall disproportionately on lower and middle income households, since higher income households would have the option of an expensive, fully integrated stationary source of backup power. Banning the sale of spark ignited internal combustion engine powered portable generators would inhibit efficient construction on job sites which don't have access to stationary standby or utility power. For all the reasons above, it is illogical to make the equipment intended to replace power from the grid dependent on power from the grid. None of the proposals suggested in the staff presentation, such as temporary exemption, interim emission limits, or a credit program, address this fundamental problem. Regulating portable generators, as proposed, will put Californians at risk during emergency situations. PGMA therefore reiterates our request that portable generators be exempted altogether from the potential amendments to the score emissions regulations. Thank you for that comment. All right, next we have a comment or a question from Sarah Samurai. The diurnal standard is 0.00 grams per day. For auto, the diurnal standard is also 0.00 grams per day. However, 0.0054 grams per day is acceptable. Can we expect the same or something similar for SOAR? Uh, thanks, Sarah. The um, standard is set to 0, 0.00, so anything that rounds to 0, 0.00 or below would be acceptable. Next, we have Robert Stiegel. Is it not true that in 2024, if the standard is zero, credits can no longer be generated, so by 2029, all credits are gone? Uh, yes, that is correct, Robert. Um, credit, credits cannot be generated once the standard is set to zero. Um, so new new credits other than the zero emission generator credits um, would be generated. Um, and so by 2029, all those uh, non-generator credits um, would be gone, would expire. Next from Sarah Samurai, can you give an example of equipment that would be exempt from the tilt test? Uh, sure. I think the um, easiest answer to that is a riding mower um, would be exempt from the tilt test. Next, we have Laurel Moorhead. I come from Paradise, California, and as everyone knows, Paradise burnt down in the campfire in November 2018. 55 hours is not enough available generator time for an emergency situation. 
further 10 times more expensive is not feasible for a lot of people. Uh, thank you for that comment. We will consider it. Michael Carroll asked, are fuel cell portable generators widely available in the U.S. market? Hi, this is Christopher Dilbeck. Uh, to answer this question, are fuel cell portable generators widely available in the U.S. market? That would, uh, portable being uh, an important word there, I think. In general, fuel cell generators uh, are widely available, and of course, um, many of them are larger. Uh, so some portable fuel cell generators are available, widely available, I think is a bit of a subjective um, thing. So I, I can't say whether or not they're widely available uh, for portable generators. Next question is from David Peach. Has CARB estimated the TWH requirements for transition to Z in the state of California? Would these TWH requirements would be an adoption in addition to other CARB ZEV, such as ACT programs, which based on simple calculations, shows TWH deficit of over 50% from the total calendar year 2015, California production of approximately 200 TWH, with a consumption of approximately 260. I think this is this is getting at uh, to total electrical demand in terawatt hours, um, and um, we don't have those numbers um, at hand, um, so. We, we can't say what the increased um, potential demand would be. Next, we have Hideharu Takamoto. Regarding zero emission generators, such as fuel cell, how CARB is going to approach to determine that those technological feasibility and cost effectiveness? Yeah, so we approach, approach technological feasibility and cost effectiveness this, uh, the same regardless of equipment type. Um, technological feasibility is, is there technology out there um, that can do the job um, at either lower emission standards or at a zero emission standard. Um, cost effectiveness is based both on upfront cost of the equipment as well as operational costs. So that includes both fueling or recharging for electrical equipment. Um, as well as uh, maintenance costs of the equipment. Britt Fleming asked, when staff says that certain requirements kick in when the amendments are effective, is that when the CARB rulemaking process ends or when a valid EPA waiver is obtained? Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, there are certain uh, requirements that will kick in uh, once the, the rulemaking process ends. Next, we have Scott Sadowitz. On slide 29, you mentioned how proposed HD plus NOx standards are based on certification levels of existing engines. Do these existing certifications use the proposed extended durability period? Um, so what we're proposing here are not really extended durability periods. They're the longest of the currently available durability periods. Um, and there are engines certified at or below these levels that meet the longest of the durability periods, yes. Next question from Michael Carroll. 
a staff taken into consideration that the impacts of banning the sale of spark ignited internal combustion engine powered portable generators would fall disproportionately on middle and lower income households that cannot afford more expensive stationary standby power. Sorry, Matt, can you repeat that question again, please? Yes, I can. Um, scroll up. Has staff taken into consideration that the impacts of banning the sale of spark ignited internal combustion engine powered portable generators would fall disproportionately on middle and lower income households that cannot afford more expensive stationary standby power? We don't have any evidence that that would happen, um, that the cost would for dis fall disproportionately on lower income households. Um, we would be interested in seeing it if you do. Okay, next we have a question from Sarah Samurai. When can we expect to see the results of the feasibility study? When can we expect to see the results of the cost effectiveness study? Thanks, both cost effectiveness and feasibility um, will be addressed in the standardized regulatory impact assessment, which will be published in the spring or summer um, by the Department of Finance on their website. Um, and these things will also be addressed explicitly in the initial statement of reasons, the staff report that's published at the beginning of the 45 day comment period. Next question is from Britt Fleming. If the amendments take effect before a valid waiver is issued, how does CARB reconcile that with the requirements in the Clear Air, Clean Air Act Section 209? Thanks for that question, Brett. Yeah, um, CARB will be working on the authorization requests uh, with EPA after uh, the final rulemaking process ends. Um, and we'll have more, more to discuss at that point with uh, the public. Okay, the next question is from Blaine Hageman. Can you discuss the impact on commercial mowers, i.e. 25 horsepower SSIE, with 10 gallon fuel tank operating for 6.5 hours, compared to a 10 kilowatt hour battery operating for one and a half, three hours? Include discussion of a $3,500 battery versus a 1,000 SSIE engine. Will all commercial mowing go to diesel? Thanks for that question. Um, there are commercial um, battery operated lawnmowers available that last um, much longer than one to three hours. Um, as far as the impact on um, mowers generally um, and whether they will go to zero, that's hard to speak to. Um, there are good zero emission um, equivalents available today, um, but commercial users can make their own decisions about what kind of mowers they want to buy. Um, and these regulations do not affect diesel equipment. Next question is from David Johnston. With the push towards making everything electric and considering the already overtaxed electrical generating capacities in California and Western US, with no significant increase in generating capacity on the horizon, the cost for electricity will in all likelihood dramatically rise as it has done in Germany with their similar transition to all electric. So the operations cost savings justification may well be unlikely to materialize. Has CARB staff researched Germany's experience and are staff going to make this into consideration, take this into consideration when presenting the recommendations to the board? Thanks for the question. Um, we have not explicitly studied Germany's electrical costs. Um, we do have projections of California electrical costs over time and how they're likely to change over time, and those are included in our economic um, 
impact assessment, um, which will be published as part of the SORIA, the Standardized Regulatory Impact Assessment. Um, and so those are included there. Next we have Chris Ryan. Thank you for presenting this all today. Appreciate it. We are an OEM for commercial carpet clean and emergency restoration. Our industry operates in many conditions with the absence of power, flooding, hurricanes, freezing, etc. Our equipment is critical in operating in conditions with the absence of power for extended periods of time. What is the process to add our equipment to a preempt status listed on your website? Thanks for that question, Chris. Um, there is uh, no formal process. We receive requests uh, periodically from uh, manufacturers to determine whether or not uh, equipment is exempt from our regulations. Um, we can contact staff uh, for further discussion on that. Next question is from Christoph Modell. How can bank credits for HC plus NOx and PM be used for model year 2024 and subsequent model years for handheld equipment if there's no ABT for CO or EVAP in the current exhaust and evaporative emissions regulation and no credits could be generated for this? Thanks, Christoph. Um, for the EVAP credits, um, engines under ADCCs for hand, handheld engines will be allowed to um, uh, earn EVAP credits as soon as the regulations are adopted under these potential regulations. Um, in addition, we are allowing credit trading across engine classes. Um, which would allow 80, uh, smaller engines to use EVAP credits earned on larger engines. Next, we have Brian Doklovich. Thank you for the workshop information. Will California or CARB present an information program showing how, what, and when new sources of renewable energy will be available in each region to your customers through infrastructure changes? So industry can supply products that is accurate to California state capability for the future. Hi, Brian. Uh, this is Christopher Dilbeck. Um, I think we're not quite clear on on what you're asking here um, but perhaps you could follow up with us um, by email uh, and we could get a better uh, understanding of this next we have three kanchi botla follow-up question you mentioned earlier portal generators contribute to 20 percent of overall store emissions would you please make the data available to public supporting the claim and the type of users, consumers versus commercial, and frequency of usage? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, that 20% number uh, comes from our model SOAR 2020. Um, if you want more details on the types of users, the breakdown of user type and frequency of user, um, you can find a lot of it in the documentation for the SOAR 2020 model. Um, it's linked to from both the SOAR website and also if you go to arb.ca.gov and search SOAR 2020, um, you should find that pretty easily. Um, in addition, if you have further questions about that or want more details on that breakdown, you can reach out to our colleagues um, in. AQPSD um, who uh, developed that model. Um, if you send an email to the comment one or to any of us, we can put you in touch with them and they can help you find the detailed information you're looking for. Next question is from Michael Geller. Have staff analyzed the potential for generators to be used in a new and or greater use case for recharging commercial Z landscaping equipment on work sites? Uh, thanks for that question, Michael. Um, we have looked into the potential for generators to be used more. Um, we don't have any substantive evidence about that. 
Um, so it's hard for us to answer in great detail, but we have considered it, um, but we don't have any evidence about it. And Amber has comments from Wester Beak Corporation. We are the only manufacturer of marine gasoline generators in the U.S. Will marine generators continue to be included under the proposed SOAR regulations with a transition to Z? Marine applications need larger quantities of power for extended periods and they extend to weeks, months, or even years for people who live on their boats full time. Best regards. And it looks like, uh, Glenn, you have a, an additional comment right after. You said, in the marine industry, higher CO levels are immediately dangerous to the human life and safety because of the inverse balance between NOx and CO when calibrating an engine, lowering the HC plus NOx levels to a proposed level like 0 0.8 grams per kilowatt hour for generators from 2014 would result in a substantial increase in CO emissions. This increase would pose immediately danger to, immediate danger to human health in a marine environment. EPA recognizes this risk and has special regulations for solar marine generators. How does CARB propose to address the situation? Um, it's difficult to answer this question without more details about the types of marine generators we're talking about. Um, whether or not they would be subject to SOAR regulations depends on the details, um, and we would need more details on the type of generator that we're talking about. Next, we have a question from Uma Shabala. Can model year 2024 equipment with solar built before January 1, 2024 be imported into California after January 1, 2024 and beyond? Hi, uh, this is Christopher Gilbeck. Um, so, Umesh, under the, um, the, the draft um, proposal that uh, was discussed today, um, the new emission standards would apply to model year 2024. So if an um, engine or an evaporative system were model year 2024, um, it, it would be subject to those emission standards. However, if um, a piece of equipment is considered model year 2024, but uses uh, and I should say considered model year 2024 by the equipment manufacturer, the chassis manufacturer, let's say. Um, but the um, engine were model year 2023 and the EVAP system were model year 2023. Um, that would be model year 2023 um, uh, in, in terms of uh, CARB compliance. Uh, however, if a manufacturer were building uh, model year 2024, um, EVAP systems with model year 2024 um, engines, those, uh, even if they were built before January 1st, 2024, um, would still be subject um, to the model year 2024 uh, emission standards. Doug Hartley asks, has staff considered the electrical load required for in-home medical devices for Z? Example, oxygen concentrators or in-home dialysis. Um, we have looked into this um, and we will continue looking into this um, and we'd be interested in any data you have addressing this issue. Sasha Schneider asked, how can a handheld equipment manufacturer use the bank's credits for HC plus NOx and PM for model year 2024 and subsequent? If there's currently no A, B, and C system for CO or EVAP, hot soak, and the current regulation for exhaust and EVAP emissions, how can a zero gram standard for CO and SHED be averaged in 2024 and later? Yeah, so I think this is the same question that came up earlier. Um, but uh, as far as the ABT side goes um, and the, um, the lack of EVAP standards for smaller equipment, um, they will go, the, the smaller equipment will be able to certify for credits um, 
once the regulations go into effect. Um, so they will be able to earn credits then. And additionally, we're allowing credit trading um, across engine classes, which will allow for those credits to be used for the smaller equipment that currently does not have an EVAP standard. Um, and for CO, um, we will look into putting in a CO standard um, that will not uh, create that as the barrier to engine manufacture. Next, we have Ann Komen. Are there any data on the health consequences, like say cancer incidence or COPD, of SOAR on commercial landscapers? Such data could persuade more landscapers to switch to Z sooner rather than later. Yeah, so the data um, that exists is, I would say, fairly sparse. Um, CARB did a initial study um, a few years ago looking at um, what operators are actually exposed to when using the equipment. Um, and how that might translate into a cancer risk. And a, a white paper about that pilot study is available on the CARB website. If you need help um, accessing it, uh, you can get in touch with one of us and we can send you the link to that. Um, CARB is planning a follow-up study to look in more detail um, with further data about, um, to, to help quantify that risk better and more robustly than that pilot study does. Um, but otherwise, the data about it is pretty sparse. Eric Smith's comment, would a, a permanently mounted generator in an RV be considered the same as one permanently mounted at home? The generators used in our facility, at least, would be the same units utilized for that purpose. You had stated earlier that SOAR did not apply to permanent home units. Thanks for the question, Eric. Um, the uh, evaporative emission regulations contain uh, an exemption um, for uh, generators in a um, uh, on-road vehicle or a marine vessel that um, exempts them from having to meet uh, the diurnal emission standards and the hot soak plus diurnal emission standards uh, under the draft proposal. Um, that uh, under the draft proposal will continue to be the case. Um, but these units um, are subject to the SOAR regulations in, in the, um, the on-road vehicles. Before getting to the next question, I just wanted to let everyone know there's about 10 minutes left in this workshop. Um, we'll get to as many additional questions as we can before the workshop ends at uh, noon local time, but I will go to the last slide in the presentation for card contact information. Uh, if you have any additional questions after this workshop, um, you can send an email to, to anybody listed here. The next question is from Patricia Kushner. Um, she had a concern about the future ban of gas powered landscape equipment, leaf blowers, etc. cetera. Um, is that how will small business landscapers be able to afford the new Z equipment? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, the upfront cost of Z equipment um, compared to the gas equipment varies by equipment type. Um, but overall, uh, the equipment is anywhere from actually less expensive than the gas equipment to maybe two times more expensive for most standard equipment used by small landscapers. Um, as far as how they can afford it, there are exchange programs available. Um, and this is, it's really important to bear in mind that these regulations are um, for manufacturer of new equipment. Um, and so what's available um, in stores can sometimes take a long time to catch up to that. Um, and in addition, we expect over time, the price of the zero emission equipment to come down. Um, and we also expect cost savings coming from operation of the zero emission equipment. Oh, and finally, sorry, I did have one more thing, which is that um, they don't have to buy all the zero emission equipment at the same time, right? They can acquire it over time as their gas equipment breaks down, they can replace one piece at a time. Um, and so they're not absorbing all the upfront costs at the same time. The next question is from Jeff Ward. How will currently certified components such as gas tanks be handled for future service parts made after 2024? Hi, this is Christopher. Um, 
I think we might need more information about what you're asking about, um, Jeff. I, I could mention briefly that um, in the, the applicability um, section of the evaporative emission regulations, there is a requirement for um, components um, and, and evaporative emission control systems to be certified and labeled. Uh, according to the, the requirements of the regulations. So um, if, if you have further question on that or need further clarification, Jeff, um, if you could follow up with us. Next, we have Archer Starosiak. Um, zero emission generators like the ones shown from LG on slide 19. Are five thousand dollars for five kilowatts plus solar solar panel plus installation costs. Do you have concern that this is too high a price for something that is critically essential for people to survive in some areas? Many struggle to buy ICE engines as is, especially during a situation like we just saw in Texas, where they are also facing increased costs of the storm itself. Yeah, these market reasons are a large part um, of why we built more time in for the transition to Z generators. Um, we expect the cost of Z generators to come down over time. Um, not everybody has to buy that particular LG generator. Um, there are a large variety of costs available now even. Um, and we expect with the um, implementation of the zero emission generator credit program, um, to bring some equalization to the price between gas and Z generators. Patricia Kushner asks, if we move towards a lithium-based products, will that increase the risk of fires? Um, we do not expect an increase in fire risk. Um, lithium batteries are subject to um, regulations um, by the CEC in California, and new lithium chemistry may not be as fire prone as others, and also gasoline is flammable, um, so we don't think we're increasing the risk of fires. Hario Takamoto asks, we understand the importance of fuel spillage during real use. How is CARB going to quantify the social benefit of tilt testing to determine cost effectiveness? Hi, this is, uh, this is Christopher. Um, if, if you have um, suggestions along these lines, um, we, we would welcome them. We do expect that um, it's possible manufacturers would have more information than we do about um, fuel spillage from engines. Um, and uh, I would also point out that the, um, the tilt test um, is, uh, serves the purpose not only of um, ensuring that fuel would not spill, but also ensuring that um, canisters uh, would not be um, exposed to liquid fuel uh, when products are moved around or tilted by users. So um, one way of determining the effectiveness um, of the tilt test is seeing that engines uh, meet the emission standards. All right, next we have least person i.e. no regulations considered for the CO2 emissions from Z. Yeah, I think this is a follow-up from Leaf's earlier question um, about CO2 emissions um, from SOAR equipment. Um, and you were correct, there are no regulations um, on zero emission SOAR equipment right now, so there are no regulations around or considerations of the CO2 emissions that would come from charging of C. Next we have Justin Ham. While provisions for emissions credits for engine manufacturers could play a part in the transition from SOAR to Z, has CARB considered the time engine manufacturers will need to improve existing SOAR engines and recoup their investment in these improvements? Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, we have considered that. Um, carefully, and in fact, that's why we removed the lower standards for Mosor for two years because there was, um, uh, it's one of the reasons, there were a lot of comments about the two years being insufficient to recoup technological costs. So we don't really envision there being um, major changes to the SOAR technology in that time frame. Um, we expect credit generation to come from engines already in use. There's already an existing credit bank out there um, on both the EVAP and the exhaust side. Um, and so manufacturers can use the credits that they are already capable of earning as well as Z credits. Next from Sarah Samurai, regarding the tilt test, there is no time frame indicated for how long it should take to tilt from zero degrees to 90 degrees. Does ARB plan to specify? Uh, we would welcome suggestions for that. And David Johnston, to follow up on the other participants' questions regarding the availability of Z equipment, given that the batteries produced in an entire year by Tesla's Gigafactory could supply U.S. power needs for only five minutes, is it reasonable to assume that availability of CEG would match the demand? And has CARB staff considered that that shortage could dramatically increase the cost of ZEG? Um, SOAR generators are a small portion um, of generator power production in the US. Um, I'm not sure what the comparison to US power needs um, is addressing. Um, we don't think that this regulation would drive up the cost of zero emission generators. We in fact think with the zero emission generator credit exchange program that it would go down. If you have evidence that it would increase the cost, we would welcome that. Next from Dennis Lamberty. With regard to staff statement concerning purchasing portable generators based on educating consumers to a specific need, consumers typically purchase portable generators based on worst case anticipated emergency needs or other time extending power and project needs, and not necessarily for tailgating or for simple charging. Applications which can apply with a smaller and specific consumer segment as mentioned by staff. With that said, and with Z technology is not financially feasible and available for the average consumer to have power for the noted worst case extended conditions, or project needs should be considered with this proposed rulemaking for portable generators. Thank you for that comment. If you have any evidence about um, portable generator use um, and that they are generally not used, uh, that what they are purchased for, um, we would welcome that evidence. All right, our time is just about up, but it looks like we only have a few more questions, so we'll see if we can get these last few. Uh, we have Ty Riggins. There is currently not a single Z available that can meet the requirements of a commercial cleaning business, hazmat, cleanup, disaster, et cetera. Any thought on adding commercial pressure washers to preempt list, given this will not be solved by 2024? And I'll just I'll repeat that question. There is currently not a single Z available that can meet the requirements of a commercial cleaning business, hazmat, cleanup, disaster, et cetera. Any thought on adding commercial pressure washers to the preempt list, given this will not be solved by 2024? Thanks for that question. Um, so the commercial pressure washers aren't considered, um, you know, preempt equipment as provided in the Clean Air Act. Um, it's not construction equipment or farm equipment, so uh, to our knowledge. But if you have evidence to suggest otherwise, we would we would welcome that conversation. Next, from David Horst, lithium-ion batteries have a useful life. When the batteries are no longer useful, what is the expectation of disposal process? Who will bear the cost for that? Uh, 
Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, in California, um, batteries cannot be thrown in the trash, so we don't expect um, there to be a significant hazardous waste issue um, from that. There are um, already programs in place in California for disposal of batteries um, for all residents. Um, where batteries must be disposed of um, with a, an appropriate um, recycling program. Next from Masaru Yamamoto, hot soak less tests should be conducted at 35 or 40.6 degrees C, 95 or 105 F. A 15-minute engine running does not specify temperature requirements. Is there any technical reason why CARB does not specify? Hi, this is Christopher. Um, I, I think what uh, the, the question is getting at is an ambient temperature um, is not specified for running um, the engine for 15 minutes uh, prior to the hot soak. Um, the, the procedure does not specify an ambient temperature during that runtime, uh, and if, if you have a suggestion for one, um, then we would welcome that. Ihara Takamoto asks, slide 20, it is counterintuitive that power shutoffs will be less frequent considering recent increasing wildfires. Is this trend still valid? A, looking at longer time horizon like 2000 to 2020. B, not only PSPS, but power shutoff in general. Yeah, it's a little hard to look at longer time horizons because of the standards around the public safety power shutdowns um, have changed. Um, but the reason we expect uh, fewer and shorter shutdowns in the future um, isn't really related to wildfire risk. It's related to um, uh, making better infrastructure around the power grid um, and making it so that there is less of a fire risk um, from electrical delivery during high wind events. Um, and so we do expect the frequency of public safety power shutdowns to decrease as well as their length due to infrastructure upgrades. Did I miss the second half of that question, Matt? Can you repeat that question? Sure. Uh, it is counterintuitive that power shutoffs will be less frequent considering recent increasing wildfires. Is the trend still valid? A, looking at longer time horizon like 20 years, or B, not only PSPS, but power shutoffs in general? Oh, power shutoffs in general. Yeah, um, again, the infrastructure upgrades that are expected that are primarily being driven um, to decrease the public safety power shutdowns, we expect to also decrease the need for all power, or the need and occurrence of all power shutdowns. All right, and our last question is from Joy Walters. Is there or will there be a certification available for landscapers and residents for manufacturers of lawn equipment to show their movement to Z equipment? Yeah, so CARB doesn't have any certification like that right now, um, but there are some zero emission um, landscapers in the state. Um, and from what I've heard, they are very popular and generally booked up. We do maintain a list of the ones we are aware of um, on our Z website, which is arb.ca.gov slash ZEE. -E. Um, and if we are missing any zero emission landscapers that you know about, or if you are one, um, please let us know. We'd be happy to add them. We've done our best to find the ones um, that we can, and we'd love to know about more in the state. All right, thank you everybody for your questions. I will now uh, pass it back off to Manisha Singh for uh, closing remarks. Thanks, Matt. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time out of the schedules to participate in today's workshop. Really can't overemphasize the impact of your participation on the overall quality of our um, tool making process. We encourage all of you to continue to engage with us. Send us follow up comments and any feedback that you have specific to the areas we um, talked about today in our workshop. And uh, with that, uh, we are now adjourning today's workshop. Thanks.